My name is Sue Kleingartner. And where do you live, Sue? Uh, I live on a dairy farm five miles south of Gackle, North Dakota. And did you grow up on a farm? Yes, yes, I grew up on a farm in New Salem, North Dakota, a dairy farm. And what type of chores did you do, do growing up? Uh, milking, which I didn't care for. <laughs> um, field work, haying. Uh, checking on dry cows, delivering calves, feeding calves, anything that needed to be done. And did you have brother and sisters? Yes, I have one sister and one brother. And did they work on the farm with you as well? Yes, they are both older than me. My sister is 10 years older than me, um, and my brother is 7 years older than me, but yeah, we work together. So by the time that you were growing up, were some of them starting to leave the home? And you had to take over some of the responsibilities? Yeah, my sister was in college and I was in elementary school when she was in college. Um, and my brother left for college too and then it was just me. So yeah, had to milk and help with chores and do what had to be done. So growing up on a farm like that, um, did you feel different than the, the kids that lived in the city or the town <laughs> kids? Yeah, very much so. I, I felt different because um, big thing in New Salem was wedding dances and so all the high school kids we go to wedding dances and dance. Uh, I can remember one time I had to go help my brother in the hay field because it was going to rain. Needed to make the hay so we were out in the hay field um, 11, 12 at night and all I could think of is oh I wish I was dancing <laughs> at the wedding dance instead of baling hay but you had to just it was different. The town kids could go to stuff like that all the time and when we had chores to do, we had to stay and do them. Now, where did you go to school? New Salem. I went to school in New Salem High School. So were you able to participate in activities? Yes. I was able to participate in basketball, track, um, and I was a cheerleader. I was in a sport year-round, usually. And how did that work out with the farm chores and that sort of thing? I was lucky because um, during the school, when I was in activities, I got a break from doing farm chores. So that's kind of maybe why I uh, did a lot of activities. I didn't really like running track, <laughs> but it was better than milking cows, I figured. So that's why I did that. And were you involved in youth farm activities as well? I was very involved in youth activities. Um, a big part of my life growing up was uh, being in 4-H, um, showing cattle in 4-H, showing dairy cows. So yeah, that was a big part of growing up is um, just showing remember, memories from showing cattle and 4-H and then later open show. So when you were in high school, uh, was your goal to grow up and marry a farmer and live on a farm? <laughs> My goal um, after high school was not to marry a dairy farmer. I even told my dad when I left for college, I went to college at Dickinson State University, I told my dad and mom that if when I go to school, if a guy asks me out, I said the first thing I'm going to ask is if he's a dairy farmer. I said, and if he's a dairy farmer, I'm not going to date him <laughs> because I truly didn't like milking. Um, and then what happens, I meet my husband and he's a dairy farmer. What was your major in college? Uh, my major in college was secondary education. Did you ever get a chance to teach? I taught in the Gackle School for a year um, on a part-time basis and then um, we actually became pregnant with our first child and I wanted to stay home and raise my kids so I just came home and we milked a few more cows. So why don't you tell me about uh, the farm you have here, you and your husband have, tell me about the farm and what side of activities you do. <clears throat> Uh, not, not activities on the farm, what type of crops and things do you do on the farm? Okay, we, uh, my husband and I run a 100 cow dairy farm. We also have 300 head of commercial beef cows. Um, all, we manage about 5,000 acres, um, 3,700 of that being pasture. Um, all the crops we grow are corn silage and hay feedstuffs that we make for the animals. Um, we do not sell any cash crops, and um, yeah, I, <laughs> sorry. that's fine. But yeah, that's uh, that's basically 
everything we raise is for feed for the cattle. So it's ironic that you're on a dairy farm, but uh, do you still not like milking cows? I still do not like milking cows. Um, that's the one thing I'll do it if I have to do it. Um, I just, there's something I don't care for it. Um, I will do, I develop all the calves, I raise all the calves. I do most of the field work here. Um, my, it's kind of works out really good because my husband doesn't like the field work and he likes milking. So he does the majority of the milking where I do all of the seeding, all of the baling, raking, haying, everything, everything else I do in the field. Yeah, I want to go back to a couple things you said, but first I want to make sure we don't forget to, uh, why don't you tell me about your family, your, your, your kids and everything? My family, I'm married to Ross. And I, we have two children, um, our son Lane, who is 23, and a daughter, Sydney, who just turned 17. I was talking to Lane, but uh, we were talking about oh, winning prizes at the state fair and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. So must, the kids must have been involved with uh, FFA and things like that when they were growing up, huh? Yes, both of my kids are very, were very involved in both 4-H and FFA, um, show dairy cattle in both and they um, show in the open divisions also. So, and, yeah. And do you think any of them are going to go into agriculture? Uh, yes. Our son is currently farming with us. He came back about three years ago and is going to be the fourth generation on this farm. So when you said he came back, where was he? He was, Lane was attending college at Bismarck State University. He has a degree in car carpentry. And after he graduated, um, we lost our hired help. And it was a situation where he either, he was uh, toying with the idea of coming back um, and helping on the, uh, and, and taking over the farm, but he didn't know for sure. And when we lost our hired help, um, he had to make that decision and he decided to uh, come back and start taking over the farm. Do you think he's happy with that? Decision? Yes. He's very happy with that decision. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you manage about 5,000 acres. Mm -hmm. What do you mean when you say you manage? Uh, we don't own all of the acres that we take care of. We rent. Um, we own some of it. We rent some of it. Um, manage just as far as, you know, um, fencing, grazing, um, and like crops and things. So that's what I meant by managing. So we were talking earlier off camera about the difficulties involved with when a family has a, has a child and wants to become part of the farming mm -hmm. operation. Why don't we talk about that? Yes, um, we we're very happy that our son chose to come back um, and take over the farm. Um, it's a heritage that you'd like to pass on to the next generation, but that is also very scary because um, agriculture is difficult. Um, it's not an easy profession and you on one hand want your child to take it over and take it further than what you took it but then it's also you think well maybe not it would probably be easier if they got a different job um, and just the financial difficulty of bringing another person onto the farm so with him wanting to come back and farm with us that means we have to expand and grow the farm so that there is enough for two families now. Um, but yeah, it, it, overall, it's been great having him back and we wouldn't want it any other way, but there are some difficulties and challenges with that. Well, not, not specifically in your case, but in general, what, what are the difficulties if, if a young person, male or female, uh, decided that they would like to become a farmer? Financially. Um, that's the, the biggest difficulty. If you don't have help or um, a family to pass on an already established farm, it would be very difficult for a young person just to start up out of the blue and become a farmer. What are some of the, the capital, financial capital obstacles that they would face? Um, just the price, the price of land, the price of equipment. Um, it's astronomical and it, you know, how do you go to the bank and say, okay, I want to start farming and I need to buy this farmstead and I need to buy all this equipment, but you have no collateral to get a loan to do it. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's very difficult, um, almost impossible, unless you, your family is already in it and it can, 
p be passed on slowly in transition. As we have, as we have been talking to people this past week and before, uh, one of the things that comes up is people say that what they like about the farm is the farm lifestyle. Mm -hmm. When you hear that, could you explain that to someone who's not a farmer? Uh, farm lifestyle, that's why I quit teaching to raise my kids. Um, there was no better place that I would want to raise kids than on, in a farm setting. Um, just the value of hard work, perseverance. Um, our, your kids grow up knowing they can't be self-centered because there are chores, there are responsibilities, there's animals to be taken care of. And a lot of that, a lot of times that comes before your own <laughs> needs. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, just, just the values that can be taught being raised on a farm, um, the values that I grew up being raised on the farm, um, I think are, it's like, it, it's, it's very valuable. When I think about dairy farming, I, I have to think about the sense of commitment you dairy farmers have, because you just can't say, I'm going away for the weekend. Right. I think um, that's the, the toughest part of being dairy farmers in particular. Um, right now, we don't have any hired help, and I can count, um, we've taken one family vacation in our whole, how many years we've been married, 24 years. Um, so yeah, we, and now when we, we show dairy cattle to at State Fair in Minnesota at the World Dairy Expo and the family, we can't do that as a family unit. There always has to be two people that stay home to take care of the farm here and two people that go. Um, so yeah, that, the time commitment is a lot um, and that, but we choose to do it. You know, if we didn't love doing it, we wouldn't. Does it normally take two people to make everything work? Yes, yep. Tell me that. <laughs> yep, two, it takes two people with the amount of cows that we milk, all the feeding involved, the 300 head of beef cattle. Um, in order to get everything done in a day that needs to be done, there has to be at least two people on the farm working. Um, one person, they could probably do it, but it would... <laughs> They'd have to work probably through the night, part of the night to get everything done. So. And the cows have to be taken care of. The cows have to be taken care of. That is know. right. Yeah. Why don't you tell me about the, the pressures that you're having now with the, with the heavy temperatures for a long period of time and what that does to your operation? Um, yeah, there, in agriculture, there's always different obstacles and struggles that you need to deal with. Um, right now, we are experiencing really high heat. Um, and dairy cows, they don't like heat. <laughs> um, so when we have high temperatures and high humidity for extended amounts of time, that can lower their milk production um, because they aren't as comfortable as they usually would be, even though our, our barns all have fans and everything. Um, it just stays too hot for too long. So lower milk production means less milk in the tank, means less money for us. and. That's just one of the many things that you deal with from year to year. So not only do the cows have pressure, but you as dairy farmers have that pressure too. Yes, yep. It seems like uh, at least the dairy farmers we talk to are, are very involved in like uh, dairy associations. Are you involved with the dairy association at all? Yes, we are involved in many different dairy associations. Um, we, one, neat factor about our farm is we milk 100 cows, but they are all registered cows, and we have all seven dairy breeds. So um, I work with all seven breed associations um, on registrations, classification, um, things like that. Um, I am a member of the North Dakota Dairy Promotion Commission, um, and I also sit on the Midwest Dairy Association North Dakota Division Board. When you say it, it, it's good that they're all registered, uh, why don't you tell me why that means something to me? <laughs> meaning they're all registered, meaning they are all purebred cattle. So like when you have a registered dog, you get a, you get a paper from the AKC registration uh, to let you know that it is a pre purebred animal. 
Um, that's the same thing with dairy breeds. So we get registration papers on each animal, like from the Holsteins, the Brown Swiss, and, uh, and so on and so on, and all the breeds, um, verifying that they are purebred dairy cattle. Does that change anything with, with uh, what you get for your milk production or if you sell a cow, is that more of a um, That has nothing to do with milk production. Um, it does put a value added on the animal if you were to sell it. Say, why don't you tell me uh, both about your family and then your husband's family and how many generations they've been on the farms that they're running. Okay, my family, I grew up in New Salem, North Dakota. My family is, I am the fourth generation dairy farmer. Um, on that farm, my great grandma and grandpa uh, homesteaded it in the 1800s. Um, on this farm, Ross, my husband, is the third generation dairy farm. Um, his mom and dad farmed here, and his grandpa actually was the first one, grandpa and grandma was the first to move on to this farm and, and farm here. When you think about that and then think about your son, hopefully eventually taking over, is that important to you, that continuity? Yeah, the continuity is very important, and that's what we, you know, we're talking about before is you want to pass it on to the next generation. You don't want to be the last generation on the farm. You know, you don't, I, I don't, wouldn't want to know what it feels like to have to sell and knowing you were the last one. Um, because it's something that you take pride in. And each generation tries to make the farm better for the next. Um, and it would be a very sad thing if you were the last. Do you see that happening around you? Yes, it's been happening a lot in the dairy industry. Um, it's been a pretty tough three years in the dairy industry. And there have been many multi-generational dairy farms that have been forced to sell out. Is there a, such a thing as a small dairy farm anymore? <laughs> we are looking at it. We are a, considered a small dairy farm. 100 cows is considered small. Um, I think now all the models for dairying, they are, um, the model dairy is like a 15,000 cow dairy facility. Say that again. 15,000. And there's a few uh, going up in Minnesota that will be operational what this year. What do you think year. the largest in North Dakota is? Um, it's over a thousand. So it's not a mom and pop operation. Well, it, it can still be family owned, um, but it just it, it's not like the dairy farm where you milk a few cows and it's just your family and you that milk. Um, it, those larger operations, they can still be family owned, but there might be six families, you know, a mom and dad and they're all their children running that farm. 15, yep, there's a couple going up in Minnesota. That's chickens. It's a lot. I wouldn't want to milk 15,000. No. I told you I don't like milk. <laughs> I'm like, oh. But a lot of those 15,000 cow dairies have robots going in. Technology. So, technology, yep. We're going to talk about technology in a bit. But first time I go back, <clears throat> there's something you and I were talking about in the kitchen. And, and that was the maybe the role and the way women are perceived on the farm nowadays and how that's changed, specifically when you talked about how the farms are referred to. Mm -hmm. So if you could talk about that. Yeah, the, um, I think we're, we're coming into a generation where women are more recognized in agriculture. Um, I know for my grandmother and my mother uh, in their generation, they, worked on the farm alongside their husbands, but it was never referred to as both of their farms. It was always referred to as their husband's farm. Um, and even getting married 24 years ago, coming into it, um, it, it is a struggle because as a, as a woman, you devote your life and you, you work side by side with your husband. And people looking in from the outside um, Sometimes they make a judgment that it's your husband's farm and not yours, too. Um, so that was something um, that you had to deal with because you put your blood, sweat, and tears into it. 
but never um, get any of the recognition for it or anything like that. But it has been got, gotten a lot better um, over the years. Um, I know there's women in agriculture that are doing it on their own. Um, so yeah, that's, it's, it's come a long ways. So is that what you're thinking? Is that reflected in the name of your farm? Uh, in the name of our farm? When we, the name of our farm is Ross Sukli, and that is actually our breeding prefix um, for our registered cattle. So that goes on all of our registration papers. But yeah, when we got married, um, it was, Ross's breeding prefix was Ross Al Clee because his middle name was Al, Alan. And um, we got it changed as soon as we got married and transferred all the cows to under that name. And it's been like that ever since. Well, you told me you had actually brought cows into the marriage as well. Yes. When, I, uh, when we got married, I had um, a herd of dairy cattle on our farm in New Salem about 20 plus head um, because my parents, as soon as we were young, they gave us a 4-H calf and then everything from that calf that produced that was ours. And when you got married, my dad said, they're your cows. So I brought them with and we started milking them here. Like the olden days, you had dowry. Exactly. <laughs> it, it sounds to me like the way you approach your farm, you and your husband approach your farm, it's, it's a partnership that you have. Yes, it's very much so a partnership. And that's one thing, um, you know, getting back to the struggle of people on the outside looking in, not seeing it as maybe an equal partnership. That's one thing that I've been very blessed with because my husband has always treated me like an equal partner and has never thought anything different. So, um, yeah, we've, we've worked together every day, <laughs> every day in and out. And it, now our son is back and our daughter helps on the farm. So, I mean, that's, it's, it's, I am so blessed to be able to work every day with the people that I love. Um, it's, it's just, it's a blessing. When you uh, look around your surrounding area, would you say that your situation is more the norm or becoming more of the norm? Or is there still a lot of that old time, his farm, not her farm type sort of uh, attitude? I think it's becoming the norm. That's what I, you know, it, it, it has been getting better. Um, I think so. I think it's becoming more normal. Do you have a support group of other ladies that are in farming that you, you talk to on a regular basis? Yeah, my um, my sister-in-law, um, just anybody. They're, the, you know, not even just ladies, just other, other farmers. Um, but the biggest support group is my family. Uh, Carmen told me earlier today that you're very involved with uh, the genetics of, of on the farm. Why don't mm -hmm. you talk about that for a bit? Um, yes, our, we have 100 dairy cows, but the passion that we have for the dairy industry isn't so much in milk production, um, but the genetics of the cattle. Um, we artificial inseminate every animal on the farm. Um, we also do embryo transfer work um, to promote better genetics throughout the herd. Um, we show cattle everywhere. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where we um, are most excited about the dairy industry, is the genetic part of it. And how much time does that take? Um, how uh, do you go <laughs> it's, it, it takes, it's an everyday thing, um, everyday process, just uh, picking sires to breed your cows to. Um, and for us, it's not just, we're not dealing with just one breed of animals. We're, we're dealing with all seven dairy breeds. So that's seven different groupings of sires to choose from, um, you know, thousands and thousands of sires, picking, a, picking them out, um, who to breed to what sire. Um, it's a year round thing for us. Because you're trying to keep those breeds pure. Yes, yep, mm-hmm. And uh, could you do that? I'm gonna get technology. So is this something that, because of the, 
the technology we have now that you could do where people before would have much harder time doing it? Um, not necessarily. People have been, um, as far as the genetic end of it, artificially inseminating um, for a long time. It's been around for years, but um, yeah, the technology, the only thing technology-wise um, that has been helpful in improving genetics is like embryo transfer and um, IVF, in vitro fertilization, um, things like that. Now, are these things you can do yourself or get to have a bed involved? Um, that embryo transfer and the IVF, you need a vet in, involved. Um, our embryo transfer vet comes from Pennsylvania, actually. Um, he flies in every few months, and um, if we have something that we want to, what we call flush, we he comes out and we set the cows up, and we um, you're actually flushing out eggs of one donor dam, and then putting her fertilized eggs into surrogate cows, recipient cows. I would think that most people, when they think about high tech, if you will, involved in the dairy industry, would begin and end with a maybe a milking machine and think that's it. But you, you I imagine, you do more things than that. Yes, our parlor system um, is all computerized. Um, we don't have robotic milkers, but each milking station has its own um, computer and it collects all the data, how much milk they produce, um, their conductivity, which measures um, whether they are getting mastitis or not. Um, it all gets sent to one main computer and um, stores all the records there. So when we go out a little bit later, just tell me a couple of things that you're going to show to us. Okay. Um, show you the individual monitors at each milking station that um, where you can see all the animals information things like that um, collects all the data that is then sent to the computer um, and from there you can pull up charts and graphs anything you want to know um, about individual cows or the herd as a whole as far as milk production how do you think that your life is different than your mom or your grandma on a, on a dairy farm um, my life is different on the farm than my mom and grandma, um, just the technology end of it. Um, you know, we went, my grandma, from my grandma who hand milked <laughs> to putting on milkers, just regular milkers, to now having milkers with a computer monitor by them, automatic takeoffs. Um, just the technology has been, has grown tremendously. What would you say if I tell you that um, as we interviewed the, the older women, they all said, uh, these younger people have it so easy today? <laughs> they, they're probably right. <laughs> as far as technology goes, it, things, some things have been made so much simpler. Um, and every generation has its own struggles and, and own um, hardships. But, um, and I don't know if one is more than the other, but all I know is they're probably right. I wouldn't want to have lived through the Great Depression. I mean, some of the older generations, they, they've had to live through a lot. Um, and the, and their, their job was much more physical. Um, a lot of the technology has made it easier to farm nowadays. So you have a daughter. So what do you say to your daughter first when she comes to you? and says, Mom, I want to live on a farm. And the <laughs> second when she comes and say, I don't want to live on a farm. Um, my daughter, I'm pretty sure might, will probably live on a, on a farm. Um, she's very passionate about her cows and um, everything. And um, if she doesn't want to live on the farm, that's fine too. Um, but she could, she could have her own farm if she wanted to. Well, do you think it's a good career for a woman? Yes. Farming is a great career for a woman, just like it is for a man. Um, you have to be passionate about it, and you have to love what you do. And um, the funny thing is, the, someone, uh, 
My daughter is very active in the farm. She bales, she milks, she does whatever we need her to do, just like I did growing up. And um, a neighbor <laughs> said one time about my daughter, he's like, oh, you better hope that um, she finds a guy to marry that farms because she really likes it. I'm like, she doesn't need to marry a guy to farm. She could do it on her own. So, yeah. I know what your least favorite thing about farming is. Tell me <laughs> what your favorite thing is. Um, my favorite thing about farming, um, probably I have two favorite things. Um, when we're calving out all the beef cows in the spring, um, I love calving season. It is so great to go. We have um, late April, beginning of May. So all of our cows are out on the pasture, on green grass, and um, going out and checking all those calves and the cows in the morning and seeing the calves run down the hill with their tails up and enjoying the sun, sun and everything, sunning themselves, um, that's one of my favorite. And I also enjoy baling because that's, for me, um, I'm an, I love reading. But I never get a chance to because there's just no time ever. So when I bail, I get my audio book <laughs> and I put it on in the tractor and I can go. I'm like, just let, they're like, we have to spend the whole day bailing. And I'm like, yes, because <laughs> I get to go in the tractor for the whole day and I pop in on my audio book and I, I get to, that's kind of like a vacation, a mini vacation for me. <laughs> That's something that I get to, you know, I don't mind bailing and then I can enjoy listening to a book and yeah, so those are my two favorite things. When you were a kid though, it must have been more difficult to bail, but then it wasn't it? To bail? Yeah. No, Same it wasn't. Thing. Same thing. Huh. Yeah. Well, you're young. Yeah, I am. Well, not really, but. <laughs> well, you're not 99. No, I'm not, nine, not quite 99 yet, but. <clears throat> So we talked about a lot of different things, and I don't want to leave anything out that you might have thought about that you'd like to share with our audience. So is there, is there anything mm -hmm. we haven't talked about you'd like to mention? Mm -hmm. Not that I know of. It's not a quiz. So it's it's not a quiz. I'm not, am I graded on this? I don't know. <laughs> um, no, that's um, pretty much everything. We've covered everything, and just the genetic part. Um, the love of showing for my whole family. Um, well, you talk about that a little yep, bit. Yeah. Yep. We, uh, we show dairy cattle. That's actually how I met my husband. Um, we met at the North Dakota State Dairy Show that was held in Jamestown, North Dakota. And we were friends for uh, quite a few years. We teach every year at the, at the show. And one year at the show, we started dating. Um, and then... I don't know, about a year, year and a half later, we were actually married. Um, so showing has been a big part of our family. I mean, we do it that every year, um, show at the Minot State Fair show, um, Morton County show in New Salem, where I grew up. Um, and then the last few years, we've been able to um, show at the Minnesota State Fair. We've had animals good enough to go there and the World Dairy Expo in Madison, Wisconsin. So that's, um, that's why we do it, because all of the artificial insemination, the embryo transfer work, we're always working to make better animals genetically. And then that success in the show ring lets you know that you are on track with that. Um, so yeah, that's, we, so what type of things are they looking for? It's basically a beauty pageant. That's all it is. They, they're they evaluating the cow for um, how perfect it is to being, um, I don't know how to say it, uh, genetically perfect it is for that breed. Um, so yeah, basically a beauty contest. It's just all on conformity. and. Uh, so there's characteristics the judge is yep. looking for? Yep, mm-hmm, yes, yep. Hey, so, how old were you when you started, when you met your husband? Ah, uh, oh man, how old was I? Um, you on or what? I was in, 
When we when we first started dating or when I met when him? When we first met him, just curious. When I first, when we started showing uh, high school, we'd see each other at dairy shows. Yep. And then um, we started dating. Hmm, I must have been 20, about 20. And then we were married by 22. Did you tell him it took a while to ask out or what? No, no. Actually, it's funny because we started, we knew each other. We were friends forever. And then uh, that one year at the North Dakota State Dairy Show, we started dating. And um, <laughs> five weeks later, he asked me to marry him. And I said, yes. And we, <laughs> I remember we went out in an alfalfa field where my dad was swathing down by the river bottom. Um, and he was going to ask my dad if he could marry me. And we're sitting in a pickup and dad gets out of the swather and comes over and looks at us and Ross asked him, can I marry your daughter? And my dad did not skip a beat. He looks at me, he's like, Sue, you know he's a dairy farmer, right? Because <laughs> I swore I was never ever even gonna date a dairy farmer. And that's, so yep, and we got married um, the year later we got married.